Jonathan, sometimes human behavior is easy to predict, but still when it happens, it makes me chuckle. You and I have been talking about the pain coming to the commercial market for a while. You and I made moves and sold properties early uh, to get ready because we knew what was coming. And what I think is particularly entertaining is, um, frankly, what I believe uh, I call mistakes, errors, whatever you want to call them, in the commercial space were exactly the ones made in residential. So residential housing, residential lending is rock solid. Real loans, 30-year fixed rate debt. No, none of this, none of the stuff that caused the great recession happened over the last 15 years. It just, it did happen. It just moved. It moved to commercial. Let's get shorter and shorter debt. Let's do interest only. Let's do variable rate. Let's have ridiculous assumptions because back in 06, people said housing only goes up. What were people saying in multifamily? Rents only go up. It, it, it's just, it is mind boggling to me. And again, one of the reasons I still speak at meetups is I want to see what the audience is doing. And I tell, I'll tell everybody 18 months ago, I went to a San Jose real estate meetup and everybody was a syndicator, a brand new syndicator. And I'm like, this is not good. This is going to end in a disaster. And it's always the debt. So human behavior repeats the sins of the past. They just move it from asset to asset. And, um, People are going to learn a painful lesson is my fear. What do you think? Yeah. So like I, I find I I'm listen, I'm a student of markets. I love markets. I find them really interesting. I find the psychology of markets really fascinating. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is there's this, this phenomenon where uh, people are always fighting the last war, right? Mm. It's just like in the army, you're always, you know, it's a criticism of sort of military planning that they're always planning for the last war, which is why, you know, the the Maginot line got built between Germany and France, because after Germany invaded in World War One, the French were like, aha, never again. And then what happened? The Germans just went through Belgium and they walked around the Maginot line. Right. So they, they weren't prepared for the new war. They were fighting the last war. And yeah. um, just the same as the U.S. military because of World War II, we have to be able to fight two wars at the same time. And that's been military strategy ever since. And it, it really hasn't, I mean, we had two pretty small wars, Afghanistan and Iraq at the same time, but those were not two like, you know, general mobilization wars that we were preparing for all this time after World War II. Always fighting the last war. The economy is the same way. Markets are the same way. So in the great financial crisis, what you saw, what Michael was just describing was the market convinced itself that housing was the safest thing possible. And that it only goes up. I mean, how many it times only goes up? That? Not only does it only go up, but that the securitized mortgages were supposedly like impervious to any kind of crash because they couldn't possibly all be, co be correlated to each other, which, you know, the thinking was, well, yeah, a few of these mortgages might go belly up, but, but who cares? Because we've packaged together. 500 or a thousand mortgages, they're all different, you know, and that means that, th that because of, um, I forget what's the analysis that they do in that there, there's some kind of mathematical analysis. I forget the name for it, that, that basically proved that this, that these were safe. Right. And of course that wasn't the case. They all, they were completely correlated. They, they were completely the correlated. Yeah. yeah. They completely unraveled, right. Entire pools just went belly up. And they went to zero. They they were they called tranches. Zero. Remember, they did. Right? Yeah, tranches yeah. of of and completely of zero, completely zero. Right. So what happened? Well, people looked around and they said, "Oh, look, multifamily did pretty well." And yeah, and it especially did. it did right. It did pretty well. And especially after the foreclosure crisis, what happened is a lot of people who were no longer in a, frankly able to uh, to buy because they had walked away from their mortgages or what have you, and they were blacklisted, they all had to rent, right? So uh, there developed this narrative, frankly, which was wrong at the time, but the narrative was multifamily does well in a recession, right? Now, it didn't actually do well in the recession. During the actual recession, vacancies were up and multifamily did not do that well. However, the two things. One is that after the recession was over and the recovery had started, 
the foreclosure crisis, which you know people forget this because they conflate the foreclosure crisis actually happened after the great financial crisis was over, right? It did not happen 2007, 2008, 2009. The, the foreclosure crisis happened like 09, 10, 11, 12, right? So the economy was already in recovery, but everybody was feeling crummy, right? But the economy was recovering. And th those people who now wa you know, walked away from their mortgages or whatever, they all went into multifamily and multifamily did started doing really, really well at that time. Now, the other half of this is that multifamily was able to sustain by and large the hit in during the great financial crisis because it had not been built up and 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 um right. what's the word uh, you know bid up so much beforehand right so the the mortgages that people had were were conservative it was on a pretty stable basis prices had prices not had not been you know bid up to incredible levels there were you know as a as a general matter of course there were individual differences but as a general matter they weren't loaded up with crazy debt structures, right? And people were able to basically ride out a pretty substantial loss of value during that time. And unless they had to refinance because the, the timing was wrong, because they had just, you know, bought at the wrong time in the cycle. But even then, because there hadn't been this massive run up in prices, even people had to write, you know, we were all actually in those days waiting around for the foreclosure crisis and multifamily, and it didn't happen. It because didn't happen. Because not in great they, numbers. Because multifamily was just not hit in in the same way because it hadn't had the, a bubble hadn't developed in it before, right? So it was set up to weather that storm really well, and then, wow, you know, oh nine, ten, eleven, twelve, all those people flood into multifamily, and it's doing great. So people thought, wowza, this is an amazing asset. We all want to be in. And as news got out of how well multifamily had performed in those years, um, just you started having this massive shift of people who had been chasing the single family you know, dream into chasing the multifamily dream. And it started to gain momentum. I noticed kind of a sea change happen about 2016 when suddenly I just turned around and there were all these syndicators out of nowhere. Right. Yeah, it was and, wild. It was it was overnight. I mean, that was yeah. It, uh, again, investors chase the latest hot thing. That's right. When I see a, a herd going one direction, my natural is to go the other direction. Yeah, me too. Which means I miss some of the run up, uh, but it also I'm frankly safe that way. Yeah. So I yeah, mean, so it, this it was is wild. This is why I around that time I noticed the prices starting to rise really uh, fast, and I didn't it didn't make me comfortable. So I kind of went into just sitting on Management. what I had, yeah. right. And managing the assets I had and not trying to buy more because I couldn't really wrap my head around the pricing. Now, obviously there was still, you know, in retrospect, there was a lot of runway left, sure. right. Could have, you know, gotten in exited before the crash, you know, on a, on a few more assets would have been fine. But at the time it just really looked kind of like it was starting to get a little frothy to me. Mm -hmm. And, but more actor, you know, more people kept on flooding into the market, flooding into the market. And as that happens, and, and here's the dynamic that's interesting, right? All of the, everything I'm about to describe happened because of the perception that multifamily was safe, right? And so here's what I find really interesting about about market dynamics. And, and it's about this fighting the last war thing. The last war was single family homes are unsafe, multifamily is safe. So we're all going to pile into multifamily because it's safe. But when everybody piles into the same asset, what happens? It becomes unsafe, right? So you're basically building up. If you think about, remember from physics when you're in high school about like, you know, there's potential energy, right? Well, the higher the market goes, the more the potential energy for a crash builds up until there's Correct. a crash, right? And that buildup comes from everybody thinking it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. So investors think it's safe. The banks think it's safe. And the, the perception keeps on being built on itself as people are exiting and making money, right? And But that just causes the prices to be bid up even further, the returns to be squeezed even further. And when the returns get squeezed, then, well, deals don't pencil out unless you start messing around with the structure of 
of the tr- of the transaction. Yes, and that's what we right? saw the last two years. You started beating right. up your spreadsheet. You started changing the debt structure. You started adding risk, not de-risking. Yes. It was it was frankly but, financial suicide for some of these deals. People, but here's the thing: people were adding risk to yes. their deals because of the perception that it was safe. Right? Yes, this they is thought the they were exactly. This is, it's this crazy. is the irony. So. This is this is like in in real time. What when people talk about complacency in a market, this is exactly what they're talking about. Investors stop being vigilant and and they just give over to the bubble, right? And they just they just adopt the narrative that this is safe and it can't go wrong. So therefore, it is okay to uh, to to do a riskier and riskier deal. People were thinking that these this risk wasn't a risk, right? So when they started adding variable rate debt to their deals because it was a little bit cheaper, right? And it mm-hmm. could make the deal pencil out a little bit. And then on top of that, they're adding a layer of preferred equity because, well, it's cheaper than than common equity, right? So, and it increases the returns to your equity. And well, it's safe because multifamily is going to go up and we're all going to be fine. And you had you know, people, frankly, who had an interest in saying this, you know, mortgage brokers and whatnot saying, Interest rates are never going to rise, right? Use variable rate debt to get your deals. For forty down. years, it was a great strategy. Yeah, and they, I mean, and they would say, "Look at the chart. Since, <laughs> yeah, you know, it goes one way. Since nineteen eighty, it goes one way. It goes down. It's kind of you know, it's a little hard to argue against that when that's been your entire life experience, and everybody is saying it, and it's the only way to get deals done." And, you know, you're not going to make any money unless you're doing deals like all of these things. And it's safe. The safe is the thing that you can hang your hat on to to justify taking this additional risk. And the problem with that is that it all goes great until it stops going great. Right. And it Mm -hmm. stops going great because something comes out of left field that exposes the risk that's built up in the system. And in this case, it actually, it was the same thing as in, in the great financial crisis, the rise exactly in interest the rates, thing. the yep. rise in interest rates exposed the dangerous structure of all of these deals. And that's what has caused the, the collapse, right? So you just see the exact same thing that we saw, you know, same, excuse me, same shit, different asset, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And, it is exactly, and, it's what I've been screaming for nine months. Yeah. This is the same behavior on a different asset. And there are LPs that have already lost their money and they don't know it. Yeah. And and so now everybody is just, you know, a lot of the reason why you heard all this like Fed pivot, Fed pivot stuff, which not really hearing so much anymore, you know, now you're hearing kind of at best, like, well, they're going to stop raising. You're going to pause, yeah. Pause. The pause will have a nuclear, you know, that may that may be true. I mean, I think yeah. they will at, at probably uh, at stop. At some point they will, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> later this year, early next year, they'll stop, I think, and then we'll get a new equilibrium. And the problem is that, for all the people who bought at super low interest rates, that value has disappeared, right? It's already because gone. The it's inverse gone. relationship between the value and the interest rate, right? So yeah. when they go to refinance, they're going to have a, a lot of trouble and a lot of people are going to get wiped out. And, you know, and then then what's going to happen? And we warned whole, you. We warned you. we warned you. you. But here's the thing. This is going to repeat itself again, right? So- this because, will be time to buy. This will be right. the time to buy. So this is going to repeat itself again. So a couple of things to think about. So what think about like what are the assets now that have that have done relatively well in this environment, right? That that have not seen like, industrial building. Right. Industrial. So a couple of things stick out to me, right? Because you've had you've had massive run-up in multifamily. Massive run up in self storage, massive run up in mobile home parks, right? All these things that some of the, you know, had been, nobody had really noticed them before. So there was a huge yeah. run up. Um, office is toxic. Retail, I think there are some smart people doing some interesting things in retail where they found the areas that are not going to be destroyed by Amazon, right? And they, they mm-hmm. figured out what those things are. But a lot of retail is toxic to people, right? What has, what has not, really taken a big hit in because of interest rates. Well, one is industrial, right? Obviously it's affected by interest rates, but we just haven't seen the same kind of like collapse, right? For industrial. Mm-hmm. And the other, interestingly enough, is hotels, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the reason for hotels is because there was no run up, right? I mean, right. people have been, people were have been sort of worried about hotels for a long enough for, time. For a long time, right? Yeah. yeah. That there was no big run up, right? And yeah, you're right. And 
and but even though the you know there was a COVID blip and things are pretty much back to where they were. I mean, I think latest I saw was ninety eight percent of twenty nineteen occupancy oh, at that's this point. In better hotels. than expected. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, ninety eight percent. I mean, we're back. Basically, hotels. We're are back, back to nineteen. Yeah, that's yeah, good. back to twenty nineteen. So I, I think when after this crash happens, people are going to turn around and they're going to go, well, "What didn't crash before? Uh, hotels and industrial." So I think the next bubble may be in those things, and that 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 gives you now sort of two options. One is, well, you can try to front run the bubble, right? Sure. Yeah. And make money, right? Yeah. Right. And the other is you're going to know that say multifamily is going to people are going to be looking at multifamily like, ah, oh, don't do Ooh, that. Toxic. Yeah. Which exactly. means that there's going to be a lot of bargains, right? I and, am looking forward to it. Yeah. And and you're going to be able to buy at high cap rates yep. and 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 just make money on cash flow like in the old days, right? Without having to, you know, multifamily has been a casino for the last mm-hmm. five years where the bet was the price was going to keep on going up because you couldn't make money on cash flow, right? You were making money as a syndicator on acquisition fees and yeah. on your exit and nothing in between. Right. And yeah. so, and that wasn't how it was when I got started, when I got started, it was all about long-term hold, let time be your friend. You're just going to, your debt's the same and your rents are going to go up and you're going to make more money as you go. And you just want to hold it and milk the cash right now. Then it got into the frenzy and people only were making money when they bought and when they sold. And yeah. I think it's going to go back to where it used to be. And frankly, where I like it better. I want me cash too. flow. I don't, I don't yeah. want a job flipping property, right? I want to, no, I want to buy either. it and build it and buy, buy the next one and build, you know, and just keep on buying the next one and accumulate that cash flow. That's what I want. Right. So I there think we're go. going to be back there again. Yeah, well, this is one of the reasons, folks, on this channel. I just I always live out loud. I tell people what I'm doing and what I'm doing uh, is I'm going to an event you're hosting in Vegas because this is an area I am weak at. I want to go hear from from people uh, in your network that are doing deals that have done things because I want to be prepared for what's coming. So uh, talk about the event and the discount for ORAT uh, fans. Yes, absolutely. So this the, the deadline is coming, folks. We're not going to be able to buy tickets to this event. Uh, anymore, but we're having this really great event, the Multifamily Wealth Project. Uh, we are going to. Uh, we have a whole, you know, amazing list of panelists, great folks showing up, like Michael, who are going to be there to hang out at a network. Um, and we have a great discount for ORAT members, which is ORAT thirty five. So if you go to multifamilywealthproject dot com, you can get a thirty five percent discount on everything, general admission and VIP access. However. VIP access ends April 6th. So if you want to hang out in the VIP room with Michael, uh, then you need to buy your ticket before April 6th. So uh, next time we have this podcast, next time we do the show, that discount will be gone. So be sure to buy it before you see me again. (laughs) Thanks, buddy.